Good afternoon and welcome. Please turn in your gather hymnals to number 738.
pray. Almighty ever living God, who govern all things, both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people, and bestow your peace on our time. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord said to me, You are my servant, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Now the Lord has spoken before me as his servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. It is too little, the Lord says, for you to be my servants, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
but those who accepted him to become the children of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Today's gospel, we see an extension of the theme from last week was the, bat the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. If you look in the Old Testament, the very last book, book of Malachi, in it the prophet Malachi writes, Lo, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way for me. Lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord comes the great and terrible day. Now John the Baptist was a prophet's prophet. was a hymn that the prophet Malachi wrote. John's appearance was like that of the prophet Elijah in that he was fearless and righteous. He came and dwelt in the desert dressed in skins with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey much like the prophet Elijah. Yet, as great as John the Baptist was, and Jesus called him the greatest man to be born of woman, John the Baptist was humble in the sense that he knew his place in salvation history. John did not try to build himself up for his own aggrandizement. But rather, he was willing to step aside when the Messiah came. In fact, John vehemently denied that he was the Messiah. Some priests and Levites from Jerusalem came to John the Baptist, and they wanted to know if he was the promised one, the Messiah. Who are you, they asked. And he admitted but did not deny it. He said, I am not the Messiah. And so they asked him, who are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And so they said to him, or he said, I am a voice of one crying out in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. So the Pharisees asked him, and why do, you ask, why do you baptize if you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? And John simply answered, I am baptizing you with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize, one who is coming after me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. So as we look through the different Gospels, we see this image of John who was humble, one who wanted to do the right thing as God willed him to do, which was to point to the Messiah. St. Matthew records the words of John saying, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Baptist says that the Messiah will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so in today's Gospel, the greatest of the prophets, John the Baptist, points to Jesus as the Messiah and gives him an introduction as it were. 
And he says something quite unique. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was baptizing with the baptism of repentance, a sign that the people had changed their hearts. But the Messiah would baptize in a new and unique way, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this baptism, the baptism of Jesus, would take away sins. Not just be a sign of repentance, but actually take away sins. And John the baptizer says that the Messiah would take away the sins of the whole world. This was quite a revelation. Something that was not intuitive to the Pharisees and the scribes and the Levites who came to possibly listen to them. And so, of Jesus, John said, in today's Gospel, the Gospel of John, he is the one of whom I said, a man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Hmm. That's confusing. A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Now those who knew John knew that he was actually older than Jesus. As we remember in Luke's Gospel where Mary received the message from the angel Gabriel and conceived Jesus in her womb, Elizabeth, her kinswoman, was already six months pregnant with John. And so John was older than Jesus. So why does John say, one who is coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me? Well, it's obvious. Obvious to those who know the secret. And we know that Jesus existed as the Son of God from the very foundation of the world. Before this world was even created, Jesus was. And so, John recognizes that Jesus existed before him in a way that transcends human nature. That Jesus was truly God. John says that this was revealed to him not through human insight. For he says, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain on him, meaning Jesus. I did not know him but the one who sent me, told me, on whoever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So John received this insight about Jesus the Messiah from God himself. The Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus told John that this was the one. And from the words of John the Baptist in today's Gospel, we see a unique insight. Something that had not been told of Jesus before. John said, Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. John says that Jesus is the Son of God. We take that for granted. We make the sign of the cross. We say it in the creed. But in those days, that was an awe-inspiring revelation, something that the people had never heard before, because it came from the Holy Spirit. And so, from John's testimony, we learn three great truths. First, that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. Second of all, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is divine. And thirdly, that Jesus is the Lamb of God, who will take away the sins of the whole world. Jesus is unique. He is the Messiah. And the priests and the Levites, the scribes and the Pharisees, who knew their religion, who knew the Old Testament, they understood what this meant, probably more so than the average person. They had the insight and the understanding to understand what John was saying. That this Jesus was no ordinary prophet, no ordinary man. Many of these learned men 
came to see Jesus and listen to his teaching. A very few accepted him. Many more rejected him and turned away. But Jesus would not be put off. Because his mission was to those who were poor and marginalized. The ones who were called sinners. Jesus was one who scandalized the Pharisees because he went out and he dined with tax collectors and sinners. Those who didn't observe the minutia of the Jewish law. They didn't follow all the kosher rules and all the traditions and all the washings that the Pharisees adhered to so closely. These were people who didn't know the scriptures inside. Those are the ones that Jesus came to say. And when they challenged him, what did Jesus respond? He said, healthy people do not need a doctor, sick people do. And so Jesus began the ministry just as John had predicted. That he would be there, healing the sick and forgiving sinners. And in almost every instance where Jesus performed the healing, he credited the person's faith. And he often said, how often did he say, your sins are forgiven, your faith is saved, go and be healed. So the physical and the spiritual healing went together. Today's gospel should remind us where each of us fits into God's plan of salvation. We are not the center of the spiritual universe. God is. Our job is not to draw attention to ourselves as individuals, but to point to Jesus, just like John did. By virtue of our baptism, we become the sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters to Jesus. We know he is the Messiah. We know he is the Son of God. We know he has the power to forgive sins. And that he entrusted the power that he had to his church. We know that. And unfortunately, it's much too easy to take it for granted. Each one of us needs to be excited about our relationship with Jesus. To realize that we have this special relationship with the Son of God who came to earth to forgive our sins and to save each one of us. Like John, our job is to point to Jesus. And we do that through our faith, in how we live, and our testimony to others. Maintaining the status quo is really something that the tribes and the scribes and Pharisees wanted to do. They liked their religion just the way it was. They didn't want to hear anything new, especially a new Messiah that would take center stage and displace them. Not so with John. John was willing to step aside and point to Jesus and say, He is the one. He is the most important one. That's what we need to do. We need to point to Jesus in everything we do, in what we say, and how we live. Because there's a world out there that needs Jesus, just like we do. They're hungry for Jesus, and the only way they'll come to know about him is if we make him known. Jesus never said that life would be easy for us or for any of his disciples. In fact, he said we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. And so that means dealing with what is sometimes uncomfortable. It's sometimes uncomfortable to speak up for our faith. When people espouse the popular sentiments towards any number of issues in our society. We don't have to be contrary or condescending, but we do need to speak up for what we believe. We need to do that because people need to hear that. 
And rather than being looked down as bigots, as sometimes we are, there is a possibility that a person might think about what we have to say and give us credit for espousing our convictions, if we do it in the right way. And perhaps that will be the seed that's planted for people to think about their relationship with God. When we think about our life in this world, we think about our duty to follow the law of God, to grow in holiness, and to get to heaven. That's our mission. That's our path. We are pilgrims. But how often have we thought that we aren't meant to travel alone? That God expects to bring others with us, just as his disciples did. Their mission when Jesus ascended into heaven, was to go forth and baptize all nations and teach them to observe all that Jesus taught. And that's what they did. They spread out from Jerusalem and took the good news of the gospel to every corner of the world. Not all of us travel. Not all of us go around the world, as Father mentioned, like our missionaries to El Salvador. But in our own circle of friends and acquaintances, we have an impact, either for good or for ill. Either we lead people to Christ, or, God forbid, we drive them away. What we need to do, what we need to do, is think seriously about our relationship with Jesus and our mission as disciples and apostles. This church, the Catholic Church, is always and always has been one generation away from extinction. Think about it. If the next generation doesn't accept the faith, the faith will gone, be gone. We know that hasn't happened, and we know it won't happen because of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit in the world keeps the church alive and well. But the Holy Spirit depends on us to plant the seed. To plant the seed of faith in others. One of the things that deacons are asked to do is to work in the world. And one of the hardest things I think a deacon finds, just like every one of us, is how do we make our faith known to others? And frankly, I find that when I go to work, and when people say, well, I'm going to go out to see a movie tonight, I'll mention, oh, that's good. I hope you have a nice evening. I'm going to go and do X at the church. Maybe I'll go to the jail and teach Bible study. Maybe I'll go to the church and be there for a Eucharistic, Eucharistic visit. Maybe I'll go visit the sick on the first Fridays. If I have a music anecdote about my grandchildren learning about the faith, I'll bring it up. Hey, it's cute because it's about my grandchildren, of course. But also it's a way of telling them I cast my faith on. And I'm not being intrusive or critical of others, but I'll tell you when a problem comes in their life, when somebody comes down with cancer, when a parent is ill, guess who they come to? They come to me because they know I'm open to them. I'll give them a hearing. And when they tell me their problem, I'll say, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And it's that easy. And it's not because I'm a deacon, because I don't wear a Roman collar at work. I wear jeans and just like everybody else. But what it does do is it makes my presence known as a Christian. And we can all do that without being preached. And that is enough to plant the seed. And when they come and talk about their problems, to listen, to take 10 minutes and listen to them. And to say our prayer. And over and over again, I've seen where the Holy Spirit has taken that seed and brought it to fruition. And brought Christ into the lives of the people. And so today I would urge 
virtue in your own way as you can. Think about how you can bring Christ to the people you know in the grocery store, in your school, in your circle of friends. And I'm sure that the Lord will bless you for that. And the Holy Spirit will make use of your efforts and bring them to fruition. As Isaiah said in the first reading, I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the year. Our hymn for the presentation of the gifts can be found in your gather books. Here I am, Lord, number 686.
them up to the Lord. It is right and just. For through this past and mystery, he accomplished the marvelous deed by which he has freed us of the yoke of sin and death. Summoning us to the glory of being now we call a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of your own possession. To proclaim everywhere your mighty works, for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful life. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end to your Christ. Especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the 
across the joints of his thighs. He can bless the apostles and glorious martyrs. And with all the saints on this constant intercession, in your presence we rely on prayer and help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, prayer, Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope and Richard Everson, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have made your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you, that their passing from this life be kind of it to you. There we hope to enjoy the the fullness of your glory, to Christ our Lord, to whom we saw the Lord, all that is good.
Our communion hymn can be found in your gathered hymnals, Behold the Lamb, number 823.
Let us pray. Pour on us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, and in your kindness make those who have merit by this one heavenly bread, one in mind and heart. To Christ our Lord. Amen. Gather hymnals to number 507. 